The next part of our first lesson is going to be what I call controlling nature. Let's think about where we've been, particularly what it was like to live in a city around, say, 1920. The First World War is over, the world is safe for democracy, and you are enjoying a standard of living that is higher than anything your grandparents could have imagined. Thanks to the reservoir system, we have clean drinking water. Thanks to our sewer systems, we have uh, toilets, drains, and sanitation. Thanks to the sanitary reforms, we have regular garbage collection. We might have gas being piped to our home for lighting, or we might have electricity. We would soon have radio in our homes. If we had the disposable income, we could have a car. Or if we didn't, we could use a trolley car or a subway. We didn't have the work and the expense and the mess of maintaining our own horse. Technology and sanitation and sanitary reforms had given us an extremely high standard of living. There were even at this time the first attempts to create smoke control and pollution control measures for industrial plants and power plants so that those horrid uh, plumes of black smoke were no longer going to be drifting off over our city. This is a mural that appeared in the New York World's Fair in the pavilion constructed by the DuPont Chemical Corporation and their motto is better things for better living through chemistry and it shows the before and after the industrial chemical revolution here we have a rural family you notice they've cut down all the trees uh, around their cabin presumably for firewood a very nervous looking mother is clutching a child that and a very nervous looking little girl is looking off into the woods. The poor father there, his back is bent low from having to carry firewood. He doesn't even have a pair of shoes. This is a very low standard of living. Contrasted with the family after the chemical revolution. We have them, now they're off in the woods for fun. They're going on a picnic. The children look happy and healthy. They've driven to the woods in their car from this clean city where they no doubt live enjoying the many benefits of chemistry. But for the average person visiting the DuPont Pavilion in 1939, the really exciting news was nylon and nylon stockings. Now you know that uh, stockings from silk and other materials tend to snag, they tend to run, they tend to wear out, but nylon uh, is not prone to those things. And here you see two women at the DuPont Pavilion demonstrating how tough a nylon stocking is. This was very big news. You also see that the DuPont Pavilion is celebrating ammonia. And this, of course, is a very important fertilizer. The conversion of atmospheric nitrogen to fertilizer to nitrogen-based fertilizers like ammonia and urea was a huge step forward in agricultural production. Ammonia was, of course, also a valuable industrial feedstock, and you could even use it to clean your windows. Technology had given us a better standard of living, and much of that was due to chemistry. If we think about the Second World War, for the first time in history, the war effort depended on technology. For the first time in history, military establishments invested in research and development in a really big way. Back in the late 1800s, the Royal Navy's decision to convert to steam power and iron ships had created a revolution in military thinking in which research and development and which science 
and technology would play an important part in the military establishment. And this idea grew over the years and until the Second World War when we see really major technology and research programs. One of the big ones, of course, was radar. This is an early radar set. It's set up during a training exercise. I believe in this photograph was taken just outside of Los Angeles. The radar installation is mounted on a truck. It is assembled from a pieces on site. It has a five-man crew and an officer who came with the unit to supervise its operation. Another big contribution to the war effort was penicillin and antibiotics. Penicillin had been in, uh, discovered several years before, but it wasn't until the Second World War that people learned how to manufacture it in large quantities. A greater standard of living was possible through technology and chemistry, period, full stop, end of story. And of course, one of the major ways that chemistry contributed to the war effort was with chemical insecticides. This is a photograph of German POWs being sprayed with DDT, a uh, chlorocarbon or based pesticide. Now chlorinated hydrocarbons occur nowhere in nature and pests have no natural immunity to them. So these materials were incredible insecticides. Now let's just take a moment and talk about insecticides. You see, there's a widespread belief amongst many people that if a little bit of insecticide is a good thing, then a lot of insecticide is a really good thing. And DDT was sprayed everywhere in the post-war era. I don't want to diminish the role that DDT played. It saved countless lives by preventing mosquito-borne infections from infecting the troops. But once it was uh, in the civilian market, DDT was widely used, sprayed throughout the country. Thousands of tons of it were deployed every summer to keep mosquitoes under control. Until this woman came along, Dr. Rachel Carson, a biologist with the U.S. government who in 1962 wrote a book called Silent Spring, in which she detailed the uh, impacts of pesticides on both human health and environmental health. Environmental health in particular, because the title of the book, Silent Spring, DDT can enter the bloodstream of birds and it interferes with the creation of strong egg shells. So many birds would lay an egg contaminated with DDT, the egg shells would be weakened by the DDT and the bird sitting on the nest would crush her, her own eggs. There will be no bird song that spring and hence the name Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was the first person to really say, hey, wait a minute, maybe some of these great chemical innovations that we are creating aren't going to be good for either humans or the planet. After she said this, the world is still in shock. <laughs>